Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse came out last month and it was an incredible movie, a real gift to Spider-Man fans. Apparently the film includes 280 Spider-Men, women, cats, pigs and even dinosaurs. And so in today's video, I'm going to rank all the main Spider-People from Into the Spider-Verse and Across the Spider-Verse from my least favourite to my favourite. Hello and welcome to Cinemaze. Now before we begin I think we need to set a criteria for who I'm going to be including in this list because as I mentioned there's 280 spider people in just the second film and ranking all of them would be a massive task that would make this video go on for ages and it would be so hard to rank them all from each other. So what I plan to do is rank the main spider people that appear in the film. So firstly they need to be a named character and secondly they need to have a line of dialogue. Also I'm only going to be ranking characters who have new footage for the these films. So the cameos that we get from Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire of reused footage aren't going to be included on this list and I'm only going to be taking into account the character's role in these films. So characters like Spider-Man from the 1967 series or Spectacular Spider-Man are only getting ranked based on what they add to these movies rather than their own series. Also this is my opinion and it's not a definitive list. I may have missed some people out so if I did let me know in the comments below. But let's start the ranking. Number 22, Metro Spider-Man. Metro Spider-Man is voiced by the music artist Metro Booming. Apparently, I don't really remember this one and I have no connection to the artist, so he comes in at the bottom. Number 21, Sun Spider. A disabled spider person who appears in the film. Again, I don't really remember this one, but the character does have comic book origins, which gets her above Metro Spider-Man. Number 20, Spider UK. Now, this is a different version of Spider UK than we normally see. Normally, we see Billy Braddock, but this version is Malala Windsor, a new version of the character. I do wish we got the original Spider UK as I think he is a really cool suit but instead we got this version who ranks higher than the last two as I do remember her appearing in the film. Number 19 Spider Therapist. A fun little joke that works well in the film and I do actually remember this one but there's nothing more to the character than that. Number 18, Web Slinger. We have Patrick O'Hara, Web Slinger and his horse, a cowboy-like Spider-Man. Stands out to me, which is why he gets above the last few spider people on the list, and he does have comic book origin. Number 17, Spider-Bite, or Margot Kess. In general, I just did not care for this character in the way that the movie wants me to. She starts the movie off loyal to the Spider Society, sending people across the Spider-Verse, but she seems to have a moment of doubt and allows Miles to escape, and then ends up joining the new team to find Miles across the Spider-Verse. But the film never explains her character any deeper than that and I don't get a sense of why she did what she did or what she believes in. There seems to be a slight flirtation between her and Miles but it doesn't go anywhere and it just seems to be there to add a level of tension between Miles and Gwen. She's a person using a virtual reality headset so I don't really understand what she is or what her powers are. Clearly she's a young super genius but that's nothing special when every Spidey is a young super genius. I know she does come from the comics from the Spider-Geddon event but it's not a character that I'm familiar with and ultimately in this film it just felt like a character the movie wanted me to care about but really failed to give me any reason why I actually care about her. Number 16, Spider-Man 67. This is the Spider-Man from the classic 1967 TV series. He appears in the post credit scene for Into the Spider-Verse and again in Across the Spider-Verse. Really it's that post credit scene that gets him to the position on this list because I thought that was a really fun iconic scene from that first film tying into a famous meme while still feeling true to the humour of the film. It references one of the first Spider-Men we ever saw in animation so it's a really nice callback. I like that they keep his art style. He appears again in Across the Spider-Verse, but I really don't remember his role in that film, so it didn't stand out to me as much. Number 15, Scarlet Spider. Next up is Ben Riley, the Scarlet Spider, a clone of Peter Parker, appearing in Across the Spider-Verse. And really, it's a shame he's so low on this list because Ben Riley has the potential to be a really interesting character. Scarlet Spider comes from a pretty controversial comic book storyline that some Spider-Man fans really don't like as it was long, it was messy, and it took away from Peter Parker's story. But there's also a group of Spider-Man fans who grew up through the 90s and really like this character and I think he can be an interesting character as a clone of Peter Parker. This movie seems to side with the people who don't really like his character and instead decides to make him a joke which is a bit of a shame but that said the jokes are pretty funny and they're very self-aware of who this character is and the era that he comes from making jokes about his muscles and how serious and gritty he is which really does sum up that era of the comics. He's also voiced by Andy Samberg who seems like he'd play really well off Jake Johnson's Peter B. Parker so I wish we actually saw those two together. I do like the design and the look they gave him. 
it really does look he comes straight from a comic book out of the 90s. So overall, an interesting character from the comics used for some very funny jokes with a cool art style, but nothing more than that. Number 14, Spectacular Spider-Man. It really pains me to have this character so low in my ranking. Coming into this film, knowing the character was gonna be in the movie was one of the things I was most excited about. A chance to see the Spectacular Spider-Man again and potentially give some closure to fans because that show was canceled way too soon. For reference, I love that series and Spider-Man from that show is probably in my top three versions of Peter Parker across all media. However, I said I'm only gonna rank them based on their appearance in these movies. And in this franchise, his appearance was disappointing. They teased Spectacular Spider-Man pretty front and center on the poster for this film, which made me think he was gonna have more of an important role. But no, he just has one line. I think if they were gonna use him for just a cameo to just have one line, they shouldn't have put him in the marketing and that would have allowed us to be surprised in theaters. And then I think I would have enjoyed it more. But really, I just ended up being disappointed. He just had one line, which is about trying to get Miles to agree to the idea of canon events, which felt a bit out of character for this version of Spider-Man. He's just used to reaffirm a message of the main antagonist of the film, which is a message that this movie doesn't necessarily want us to agree with so it's just a strange use for this character. As a big fan of the show it was of course great to hear his voice again and it was great to see his art style transition into the Spider-Verse movies which is why he gets to here on my list but I really wish they gave him more to do or a cameo which didn't feel weird for his character. Number 13 Insomniac Spider-Man. The version of Spider-Man from the PS4 games and I love this version of Spider-Man in the games and I think it was really cool to see him here. Because those games are still ongoing I knew he was never going to play a big role in this film and so I was fine with him just having a small cameo because we know we're going to see more of this character again in future games rather than spectacular spider-man which we may never see again insomniac spider-man is used for a pretty funny joke in the movie so this version ranks above spectacular spider-man because they're both quick one-line cameos but this one felt more like a fun cameo which doesn't affect the legacy of the character number 12 lego spider-man as the spot is traveling across the spider-verse he ends up in a lego universe with a lego spider-man and i think it's a really fun fresh scene while showing how unique the multiverse can be. It was nice to see a version of Spider-Man that felt quite traditional working in the Daily Bugle. It also has a really nice story behind it where the sequence was actually animated by a 14 year old animator who makes fan made Lego trailers on YouTube. So overall just a really nice fun scene with a nice story behind it but there's nothing particularly deep to this character pushing him higher up on my list. Number 11 Penny Parker, an anime style character appearing in Into the Spider-Verse and briefly in Across the Spider-Verse. She's a cool character with a distinctive power set and a different anime art style which I appreciate. But of the alternative spider people we get in the main team, I feel like she's the least memorable. Some of the other characters are more jokey, which makes them stand out more, and the less jokey characters normally get a bit more character development. Now, Penny isn't that jokey, and she doesn't get much development, and that's why she's this low down on my list. She's very briefly in Across the Spider-Verse, and clearly she's grown up, and she's a lot more jaded and burnt out. You know, it's actually become a meme about how different she seemed in that film. And so I'm interested in this character enough to want to find out more about what's happened to her between the films, but I don't think we know enough about this character to have her higher up on the list. Number 10, Jessica Drew. Coming into my top 10, we have Jessica Drew's Spider-Woman, and she's in a very similar position to Penny Parker, where she had a decent amount of screen time, but she doesn't get given the best lines or the best character development. Jessica Drew is a comic character who has been around since the 70s, so she's one of the earliest non-Peter Parker versions of the character to exist. But this doesn't really feel like any version of Jessica Drew we've seen before. She's got kind of a similar costume to the comic version, but normally she's British and has different powers and doesn't ride a motorbike. And another important version of Jessica Drew is from the Ultimate Comics where she's a clone of Peter Parker, which also doesn't feel like this version other than the fact she can shoot webs out of her fingertips. So despite having very prominent comic origins, this doesn't feel like Jessica Drew at all. That said, this is an interesting take on the character that I do care enough about. I'm definitely interested to find out more about her character. She's got an interesting connection to Gwen, which I'd like to see explored. She seems loyal to 2099, but has more of a good side. And so she ranks above Penny Parker because I'm interested to see where they take her next and whether she turns against Spider-Man 2099. Number nine, Spider-Man Noir. Now there's a big jump between number 10 and number nine here and coming into these top nine, these are very memorable, fun, interesting versions of Spider-Man. And so at number nine, I have Spider-Man Noir, one of the real standouts from Into the Spider-Verse. He's got some really funny, memorable lines. He's got this great art style of being monochromatic. And of course, most importantly, a fantastic performance by Nicolas Cage. Despite there not being much depth to his character, he gets high up on this list because of how memorable he is. Number eight, Peter Porker. So next up, I have Peter Porker or Spider-Man 
Spider-Ham and he's in a very similar position to Spider-Man Noir. He's got really funny, memorable lines, he's got a unique art style based off Looney Tunes and he's got a really good voice performance by John Mulaney. Honestly, it was really hard to choose between him and Spider-Man Noir and the reason I chose Spider-Ham is because I can't believe they actually put him in a film and made it work. Way before the Spider-Verse films, I remember reading about Peter Porker and how there was this whole cartoon Marvel Universe designed as a parody of the characters. It's a universe which dates back to the 80s, way before any kind of Spider-Verse event. And so it's always been this fun part of Spider-Man history which has existed for a while now and I love that they brought it into the movies. Number seven, Spider-Man India. I thought Spider-Man India was a fantastic addition to Across the Spider-Verse because he was a really fun character who felt like a breath of fresh air. I thought he had a fantastic screen presence and some of the best jokes in the film. At his core, he still felt like Spider-Man, but in a very different and interesting cultural environment. Now there's two reasons why I rank him above Noir and Peter Porker. Firstly, he felt more integral to the story, like introducing the idea of canon events and how Miles wants to stop them. So it felt like a more personal and story-based character than some of the other spider people. And the second reason I have him so high up here is that this is one of the cases where they actually improved the comic version of the character. They gave him a much more unique costume, they created an interesting setting with Mumbatta and they managed to include classic Spidey elements into him. So overall, just a really fun, fresh and unique character while building on elements introduced in the comic. Number six, Peter Parker. Now this is the version of Peter Parker from Miles' world who dies at the start of Into the Spider-Verse. He's a very classical take on the character and he represents the best version of himself possible who still loves being Spider-Man. He represents with great power really well and no matter what happens, he always gets back up and continues to try to do the right thing. He has some great jokes and references is the past version of Spider-Man, combining elements from what we know about Spidey to help make this one feel like the Spider-Man. Chris Pine delivers a great voice performance sounding weirdly similar to Peter B. Parker's voice but with an extra level of confidence and heroism needed for this version. Despite loving being Spider-Man and having a good life, he's a tragic character who dies continuing to fight, dies doing the right thing and quipping right until the very end, just like Spider-Man would. And despite not having much screen time, his presence is felt throughout the entire film and into the sequel, with the way his life contrasts Peter B. Parker's, the way Miles feels guilty for his death, and the fact he would still be alive in Across the Spider-Verse if Miles didn't get bitten by the wrong spider. Ultimately, just a great classical take on the character, representing everything great about Spidey, while still having an emotional core which resonates across the films. Number five, Hobie Brown. Kicking off my top five is Hobie Brown, AKA Spider-Punk. I thought this was a fantastic addition to Across the Spider-Verse. On the surface, he seems like another one of those throwaway gimmicky Spider-Man characters, but what gets him so high up on my list is there's actually a lot more nuance to the character that I really appreciate. Firstly, he has this awesome art style where it's constantly switching in and out, representing how this punky character doesn't stick to the rules. He's voiced fantastically by Daniel Kaluuya and has a lot of great jokes. As I mentioned, at first glance, he's another one of those fun jokey characters. His jokes tend to be about being a punk, not wanting to fit in, not wanting to be part of the spider society and stealing things. And that seems to be all there is to him. However, when you get to the end of the film, you realize there's a lot more to this character. Everything that he said to Miles about not needing to fit in, about not wanting to join the spider society, about doing his own thing and building his own wristband, all were true. They weren't just edgy punk jokes. They were actually right. Miles doesn't need to be part of the spider society. He should be his own person and do what he believes in. I realized by the end of the film that all the parts spider punk was stealing across the film weren't just because he was wanted to be a punk and steal things, no it's because he was stealing parts to build his own multiverse traveling wristband which he then gives to Gwen at the end of the film. It's such a fantastic use of a spider character with a gimmick, rather than just taking spider punk and making him have punky attributes, they took spider punk and gave him a role in the story that actually makes sense for a punk. But throughout all of this it still feels like Spider-Man. All these punky traits are actually Spider-Man traits, he's never been a team player, he's always stood up for what he believes in, he's never fit in. So through all the jokes, cool art style, punky traits that all matched his story, there is still a core Spider-Man feeling in there. Number four, Spider-Man 2099. Next up we have Miguel O'Hara aka Spider-Man 2099, first appearing in the post credit scene of Into the Spider-Verse, but really it's across the Spider-Verse where he shines, and he's introduced as a very mysterious character. He's an antagonistic force, but we don't quite know whether he's the villain yet. We learned his tragic backstory, but something about it doesn't seem quite right. We see his vampiric qualities and him taking injections for some reason, so there's 
still so much we don't know about this version of the character. He's brought to life by a great performance by Oscar Isaac and in contrast with every other Spider-Man on this list he is deadly serious. We don't see him make any jokes and he seems to carry the weight of the world on his shoulders even more than Peter Parker. He's a great screen presence which is normally hard to capture in animation and this is due to his voice, his massive size and his soundtrack. Despite being a massive departure from the Spider-Man 2099 character in the comics and even very different from the post credit scene in Into the Spider-Verse I think this is a really interesting and fascinating version of the character as an antagonist backed up by emotional weight but really it's that intrigue that gets him so high on my list. I want to watch the next movie to find out more about him. Is he who he says he is? Is he actually a good guy or a bad guy or an anti-hero? Are his ideas on canon events true? I hope they have satisfying answers to these questions because it's these questions which gets him so high up on my list. Number three, Spider Gwen. Heading into my top three is Spider Gwen or Gwen Stacy or Spider Woman, whatever you want to call her. I thought she was a nice addition in Into the Spider-Verse, but it's really across the Spider-Verse where she shines. Across the Spider-Verse is very much a part one of two with an incomplete ending, but Gwen's story actually goes through a complete arc and she feels like as much of a main character as Miles does. Across the Spider-Verse really put her in the spotlight. She has a very emotional story which grounds the film with personal stakes. Not only is this satisfyingly resolved by the end of the film, but it also ties into the idea of canon events and that her dad not dying as the police captain, maybe Spider-Man 2099's ideas are wrong. They do something interesting where because her art style is similar to Miles's, instead they make her universe look unique, with this kind of futuristic watercolour look very inspired by the comic art. And the look of her world shifts from a muddled, melting colour set to a solid clear colour as she resolves her relationship with her dad, which I think is just a clever way of using animation to tell a character story. I also love how in Across the Spider-Verse with her opening action scene she's making some great jokes and quips and it helps to make her feel like a Spider-Man character. That despite all these differences she is a spider person and I love that. So it's really that emotional story while maintaining that Spider-Man feeling that gets her to my number three spot. Number two, Peter B. Parker. I think this is one of the best interpretations of Peter Parker because on the surface in both movies he's so different from what we expect Peter to be like but at his core he is one of the most fundamentally Spider-Man interpretations of the character. When we first meet him in Into the Spider-Verse he's a mess, he's old, he's fat, he's tired, he doesn't want to be Spider-Man and he even seems reluctant on the idea of great power and great responsibility but he still puts on the suit, he still always gets back up and at the end of the film he's willing to sacrifice himself and never return to his universe in order to save the day. You can't get more Spider-Man than that. I think it's really powerful to see a version of Spider-Man that is older and still continuing to fail and still feeling relatable but facing different issues for his stage of life. I think if Spider-Man is to exist as a character that always stays relevant and work as a character where anyone can wear the mask, we need to have versions of the character at different ages and not be afraid to have him change. And then when we come into the second film they do something that we rarely ever see for Peter Parker. They allow him to be happy. Yes, failure is a key part of the Spider-Man character, but fans of the comics are becoming more and more frustrated by Marvel's editors not allowing Peter to grow up and get married and have children and just be happy. His marriage and his children have been undone in the comics multiple times, and so it's just so satisfying that we get to see a version of Spider-Man overcome his struggles and earn his happiness and be allowed to have it. I do wish we got more of him in the second film, but I do like what they showed us. And that's not even going into his arc as a reluctant mentor who learns to want children through his relationship with Miles or how his arc mirrors and contrasts the Peter Parker of Miles' world and his incredible voice performance by Jake Johnson who I never would have thought would make a good Peter Parker but really brings it to life as both the disheveled Spider-Man and the proud dad. Overall a phenomenal interpretation of Peter that takes him in directions that writers aren't normally allowed to go but still manages to make him feel like Peter Parker. Number one Miles Morales. Of course Miles is the main character and he gets the most screen time so he should be number one but it is pretty amazing that through all the multiverse and cameos and crazy spider people Miles still comes out as the best and still has a very personal and grounded story in both films. In the first film we get a very classic Spider-Man origin story and then in the second film we see him struggling to balance his life as both Miles and Spider-Man and then trying to be the hero he wants to be trying to save everyone. Again telling a very classic Spider-Man story through a new version of Spider-Man. He's influenced by other spider people but also challenges and inspires them back but what really gets him to my number one spot is how this is 
the definitive version of Miles and how his story really encapsulates the idea that anyone can wear the mask. I think coming into Into the Spider-Verse, most people still saw Peter Parker as the one and only Spider-Man. But it's this version of Miles and his story which really made a lot of people accept Miles as Spider-Man. Realising you can stay true to Spider-Man, stay true to Peter Parker and what he represents but through other characters. Miles in the comics can often come across as Peter Parker Lite or Peter Parker for a new generation. He doesn't always stand alone as his own character but this version of Miles really feels like his own unique character. He still has Spider-Man traits, he's young, he's smart, he likes to make jokes but he doesn't just feel like Peter Parker. He likes art, he likes music, you feel his culture. I think this version of Miles benefits from the multiverse. You can experience the death of Peter Parker which is an integral part of Miles' story, his Uncle Ben moment where he learned his responsibility and then he gets to exist in a world where he is the one and only Spider-Man trying to live up to the legacy of Peter. But he can also benefit from learning and challenging other versions of Spider-Man using the multiverse. For having powerful emotional arcs which feel true to Spider-Man and what he represents while delivering the best version of Miles making him feel like his own character and benefiting from both the death of Peter Parker and mentorship from Peter, Miles comes in at number one. I hope you enjoyed my ranking. Let me know your ranking down below in the comments. This was a super hard list to make. Some of these are really close, but who's your favorite Spidey from these films? And what other versions would you like to see in the future? If you enjoyed this, please like the video. It helped me out so much and subscribe for more videos on Spider-Man, Marvel, DC, and other movies. But for now, thanks for watching Cinemaze.